Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Isabel. I'm a software engineer at Smarkets, and today I'm going to talk about the ETL pipeline that we built to generate the accounting reports. I'm going to focus on the tech stack and the reasoning behind the technologies that we chose. Smarkets is an online betting exchange where people can place bets uh, on different events, mainly sports, but we also support other kinds of events, such as political elections. In the exchange, Many money-related transac transactions are generated. Uh, those include deposits, <coughs> withdrawals, orders to place a bet, cancel a bet, and so on. All of these transactions need to be uh, processed to generate the accounting reports, which include account uh, accounting statistics, such as the total amount of uh, uh, bets that somebody, of money that somebody can play, uh, have placed in bets over a month, the total amount of deposits, withdrawals, and so on. These reports serve two main purposes. The first one is that they allow us to have uh, control over the money that comes to markets. And secondly, they provide documentation for the relevant regulators so that they can know how we handle money at markets. The previous accounting pipeline was designed back in 2013, and at that point, the number of uh, transactions that it needed to handle, it was below uh, 190,000. Uh, the massive business growth at the markets during the last four years made this uh, number of transactions increase over an order of magnitude. And now the, the number of transactions that the pipeline needs to process is more than 8.8 million. The previous pipeline was not able to handle this number of transactions. The main problem of the pipeline was that it was a collection of uh, scripts without any formal dependency definition between them. And this was creating two issues. First, it was difficult to identify errors. And secondly, even if you managed to, to identify where the error was coming from, it was difficult to know which steps of the pipeline need to be rerun in order to generate again the accounting reports. Apart from that, sorry. Apart from that, the system was really slow. We are supposed to generate the accounting reports uh, daily, and it was taking more than 24 hours to run. And finally, this pipeline was, used, was using as persistent storage a volume mounted into the host running the pipeline. This uh, volume was uh, quite expensive, and it required maintenance in order to ensure that it was not low on disk. At this point, we decided that the best solution was to redesign the whole pipeline. Uh, this diagram represents the main, st uh, the main tasks that this pipeline needs to do. First, we need to uh, fetch the transactions from the exchange, and we, and we need to generate the transaction files with those transactions. Afterwards, we need to process uh, these transaction files to compute the daily and monthly account statistics. And finally, using these account statistics, we need to generate the final accounting reports. The main requirements of the pipeline are fault tolerance and reliability. If something goes wrong, we need to be aware of it, and we should fix it uh, quickly by running the, those steps of the pipeline that are affected by the, by the issue. In terms of storing, uh, storage, we need uh, fast reads and writes, high availability, high durability, and the storage should be cheap. We also need good processing performance. It shouldn't take more than a couple of hours to generate the uh, accounting reports. And finally, we need the pipeline to be scalable. The number of transactions at the markets continues to grow, and we don't, know, we don't want to have to redesign the whole pipeline anytime soon. In the rest of the presentation, I'm going to uh, uh, describe the design decisions that we made to uh, meet these requirements, and also the technologies that we chose. The accounting pipeline involves fairly long batch jobs, and things can go wrong while they are running. In particular, in our case, the communication with the exchange to fetch the transactions may fail. In order to pro provide fault tolerance and reliability in this scenario, we made the following design decisions. Uh, we store the transactions per day, and we also compute the financial stats per day. So if something goes wrong in a particular day, we just need to recompute the financial stats for that day and not for the whole month. Uh, sometimes things uh, go wrong in the, in the exchange, and this uh, creates uh, some problems, and we get missing uh, transactions or other sort of data corruption. In order to reduce the impact of these issues on the accounting pipeline, we always compute the stats for the last two days' worth of trans transactions. 
And finally, we broke down the pipeline into modular Luigi tasks. Luigi is a Python library that allows you to define uh, dependencies between tasks and it handles the dependency resolution for you. Uh, by breaking down the pipeline into uh, Luigi tasks, it's really easy to identify when things go wrong and which steps of the pipeline are affected and only run those steps instead of the whole pipeline to generate again the accounting reports. This is a simplified version of a uh, of a task that we have in the pipeline, which basically generates a human readable report with account statistics. A, a Luigi task is a Python class that in general defines uh, three methods. The requires methods method allows us to declare all the dependencies of the task. In this case, the generate human readable accounting report task depends on the output of another Luigi task that uh, generates a file with account statistics, but in a binary format. The RAM method is where the processing takes place. In this case, reading the input file with the account statistics and generating the uh, TSB file with those stats. And the output method allows us to define the target of the task. In this case, the report that we want to generate. Uh, this graph is a simplification of the dependency graph generated by the Luigi central scheduler. The a node in the top, in the top represent, represents the, ta the task that we trigger. In this case, will be the generate human readable accounting report. And below it, you can see all the levels of dependencies. So generate human readable accounting report depends on the output of generate accounting report, which in turn depend, uh, depends on the output of many generate accounting monthly stats tasks. The color of the nodes indicates the status of the task. Uh, yellow means pending, blue means running, and green means completed. The next requirement that we wanted to achieve was efficient storage. In, old, in order to meet this requirement, we focused on two aspects, the format of the files generated by the pipeline and also where to store all these files. Regarding the format, instead of going for a conventional, <coughs> sorry, in, instead of going for a conventional row-based format like a TSV or a CSV, we decided to use uh, the columnar format parquet. The difference between a row-based and a columnar format is the way data is stored in disk. In a row-based format, the values of the rows are stored sequentially in disk. And this is a good idea if our access pattern consists of accessing particulars, uh, the values of particular records uh, uh, yeah, the values of particular records. On the contrary, a columnar format, in a columnar format, the data, the data, the values of the columns are stored sequentially in the, in the disk. And this offers a, a, a good performance for analytical tasks like the ones in this pipeline, since it allows us to fetch only uh, those columns that need to be processed instead of having to load all the file in memory and this minimizes the amount of I.O. Apart from that, since data of the same type is stored together, type-specific encodings can be used. And uh, also, uh, general compression algorithms work better, which uh, maximize the compression factor of, this uh, of these files and also uh, minimizes the amount of I.O. Uh, Parquet can be loaded into Pandas data frames and is also supported by all the Hadoop environment. In terms of uh, persistent storage, we decided to go with Amazon S3 since it provides all the requirements that we were looking for. Uh, it provides high durability. For regulation purposes, we need to keep the accounting reports for several years, so high durability is very important for us. A high availability, we should be able to access uh, the reports whenever we want. Low maintenance, we, didn't, we don't need to care about uh, being low on disk or, yeah, doesn't really require much maintenance. Uh, Amazon S3 is quite cheap. It also allows us to decouple the processing from the storage, and what this means is that we can choose the instances of the pipeline based on our processing needs instead of having to worry about high disk requirements since all the data that we actually want to persist can be stored in S3. It can be accessed from Python using the libraries Boto or Boto3, and it comes with a nice web interface where you can check all the data that you've stored. 
The next requirement that we wanted to meet was good processing performance. We wanted fast data processing, and we also wanted an engine that was able to scale. Uh, that's why we decided to go with Spark. Spark is a general purpose data processing engine, and what Spark uh, does is uh, it uh, breaks down the processing jobs into tasks and identifies those tasks that can be run in parallel on different data partitions, and it builds its own execution plans. By doing so, Spark can do a lot of processing in parallel. Another feature that allows Spark to be uh, really fast is that it keeps data in memory when possible instead of storing intermediate results in, in, uh, in disk. And Spark's Spark comes with Python support through the PySpark uh, library. At the core of Spark, we have the RDDs, which are the fundamental uh, uh, unit of data in Spark. RDDs are resilient because they are immutable and they are fault tolerant. They are, they are also distributed because they are partitioned across multiple nodes in the, in the Spark uh, cluster, and they are a data set because they hold data. There are two kinds of operations that can be applied on RDDs, transformations and actions. A transformation applies a function on the RDD and creates a new RDD. Uh, examples of transformations are map, filter, aggregate. Actions, on the other hand, return a, a final result or write data uh, to an external storage. Transformations in Spark are lazy. They are not uh, executed right after they are called. But the transformation itself is safe, and a reference to the data that it, uh, that it uh, modifies is also safe and saved. And this is called the data, uh, the Spark lineage. And this allows Spark to be very efficient and also fault tolerant. Uh, these transformations are only executed when an action is triggered. In our uh, accounting pipeline, in our data processing pipeline, we didn't use RDDs directly, but we uh, decided to, to work with Spark data frames. Spark data frames are uh, units of data organized in columns and built on top of RDDs, but their performance is better than the RDDs uh, performance, since um, or, uh, optimizations are applied before the actual operations are executed. And also, the data frames API is more user friendly than the RDDs one. I'm going to explain how a Spark application runs. Spark follows a master slave architecture with a central coordinator called the driver and several workers, uh, distributed workers, called executors. The driver instantiates the Spark context, which is in charge of uh, breaking down the processing job into uh, tasks and uh, creating the execution plans. Once uh, Spark has these execution plans, the uh, task scheduler within the Spark context is going to ask the cluster manager for uh, executors to run these tasks. Spark has its own uh, cluster manager, and it also supports other cluster managers, such as Hadoop Yarn. Spark jobs can be triggered from Luigi. Luigi uh, comes with a PySpark task that can be extended to uh, create custom uh, Spark jobs. In this case, all the Spark operations can be defined in the main method of the class. So in here, for example, in this uh, task, we are creating a, a report with, account statistics, with accounting statistics for a particular account by filtering out the rest of the account IDs. The final requirement that we wanted to achieve was scalability. In order to meet this requirement, instead of having a Spark running on a single node together with the rest of the uh, pipeline components, we wanted to configure a Spark to run on a multi-node cluster. Uh, instead of configuring our own cluster, we decided to use Spark on EMR. EMR um, uh, provides fast deployments. It takes around 10 minutes to, prov to provision a cluster. It is quite easy to use once you know the types of instances that you want for your pipeline. And uh, your software requirements doing the configuration is quite easy. 
it is really flexible. It allows you to choose among many different, uh, different kinds of instances, frameworks to install, and you can even install external software. It comes with the EMR5 system, which integrates with S3, so all the logs of the cluster, together with the data generated by the cluster, can be stored in S3. The cluster can be uh, shut down once the processing job is done, without any data, any real data loss, because all the data that you want to persist can be stored in, in S3. The cost of running the cluster is quite low, and you only pay, pay while the cluster is running. And it comes with a nice web interface where you can check the configuration of the cluster, the task that, you, uh, that you've run uh, in the cluster, the logs, and, and so on. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit how Spark ranks on EMR. EMR has two kinds of, of nodes a master node and several slave nodes. The master node um, distributes the data and the tasks across the rest of the nodes, checks the status of the cluster and also the status of the tasks running, tasks running on the cluster. And the slave nodes are in charge of running the tasks and also storing the, the data on the file system of the cluster. Uh, EMR uses YARN as the resource manager to allocate resources to the tasks submitted to, the, to, to EMR, to the cluster to run. When we submit a Spark application to EMR, the first thing that is, uh, this, this application is going to be running on several YARN containers in the, in the slave nodes. The first thing that is going to happen is that the Spark driver is going to instantiate the Spark context. And this Spark contest is going to create the execution plan. Once we have this execution plan, the Spark context is going to ask the YARN resource manager for executors to run these tasks. The, exec the Spark executors, which are running on different YARN containers, are going to register with the Spark and, uh, with a, to the Spark with the Spark context. And this Spark context contest can then start sending a start. Uh, can then start sending tasks for execution to, to the Spark executors. To finish, I'm going to summarize the main uh, steps involved in the accounting pipeline. First, we, uh, we use Jenkins to trigger the accounting job. The reason behind it is that uh, Jenkins allows us to, to schedule the job so that it runs daily, and it's also a central, uh, central place for us to have where, where we have most of our batch jobs so it allows us to easily monitor uh, if they are all fine. The first thing that this accounting job is going to do is creating a, the accounting container with the, latest, with the latest image from the registry. And once this container is up and running, the Luigi Central Scheduler will be started. Then uh, a Luigi task that has as requirements all the Luigi tasks that generate final reports uh, is going to be triggered. The first Luigi task that needs Spark for processing is going to create the uh, Spark cluster on EMR. And once this Spark cluster is up and running, all the Luigi tasks that needs Spark processing are going to submit Spark applications to EMR. Once the last Luigi task that needs Spark is done, the, Luigi, the, Spark, the Spark cluster will be destroyed. Finally, all the data uh, generated by the pipeline, together with all the reports, can be found uh, in S3. This is the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, thanks very much. Are there any questions from the audience? Thanks for the talk. Um, you said you use Luigi. Did you do any comparison with the uh, Airflow? Um, no, we don't use. We, we use Luigi mainly in ads markets. I didn't use uh, Airflow before. Okay, but there's no like pros and cons. Mm, not of, not yeah. really. I, I've never used myself Airflow okay. before. Yeah, so, thank you. So yeah, I don't know. Um, so, 
You said you started up a EMR cluster and ran multiple Luigi tasks on it and then shut it down at the end. Um, it's not, yeah, it's not like that. We run the Luigi tasks within a, a node and then the Luigi tasks submit steps to the to the EMR cluster. We don't run the Luigi task on the cluster. Okay, I was wondering sense. if you had a way for Luigi tasks running outside the cluster to, to submit jobs to the cluster? Yeah, so we had to create our own uh, PySpark uh, Pi task. Okay, yeah. cool. I mean, um, I, ca I can show you Is it afterwards. open source? It's, it's, no, it's not open source. I mean, I can show you the code. It's not that hard. Okay, cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned that uh, you save data in parquet files, which are in S3. Yeah. And I don't know, uh, here was another great talk uh, which mentioned that they were also using parquet files and saving them in Azure. And uh, there was shown some wrapper which allows to access these parquet files stored in Azure from local computer like any other file object. Is that even possible with S3? Like, can I work with that files yeah. in S3 from my laptop? So, uh, parquet files are usually folders, right? They are not just a, a unique file. Yeah. So, when we are working in S3, since we are within the same file system, you can access them easily uh, with Voto, and read, <coughs> like with Pandas or with Spark. You don't have to do anything. You just read them with, your, with Spark. Is, it comes out of the box. However, if you are in your local machine, then what we do when we want to test it is uh, recursively download the folder so that we can then, with a Spark or with Pandas, read it. Thanks. Maybe if I get one more question. Yeah, sure, if, go if, ahead. If you submit those legit uh, jobs from, from the, to which run one, uh, in one cluster, uh, do, and you mentioned that you started cluster and finish just for, 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 for the run. Yeah. How do you manage that all those tasks run in that one cluster and, and the cluster yeah. shuts down after it's everything? So that's a good question. So we create, so the first, that, that the first tasks that, need, uh, that needs EMR is going to be the one in charge of, of uh, creating, the, of creating the, the cluster. And then we are not going Till up until the, some, some of the tasks need EMR, we are not going to kill the cluster. We only kill it, kill it when the last task that uh, needs EMR is done. And we do so using a, a Luigi event handler, handlers. So basically, we check whether all the tasks that have been scheduled are done. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? So usually the thing with Spark is that you have to be very careful about partitioning and out of memory errors and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you have any any insight on the subject or does that Parquet intermediate step solve that for you or something yeah. like that? Yeah, I, to be honest, we didn't get any any sort of error like that, maybe because we are not handling like huge amounts of data. Okay, thanks. How many rows of data are you actually handling? Yeah, in terms, okay. 8.8 .8 million, M more, like, twice, twice that, because we always, uh, retrieve the last two days, and those are just new transactions to generate the reports. We also have pre-processed data that we need to include in the reports. So draw transactions, new transactions that we need to generate uh, stats from is around like, yeah, 19 uh, million. Yeah, more or less. Thanks, uh, anyone else? No, can't see it. Okay, well, uh, can we thank our speaker again? That's really good. Talk. <laughs>